Okay, so uh, as uh, Ambassador Haira just said, I'm not a politician as well. I'm an army guy, so you will have to face some maps as part of my briefing. Um, so what I'll try to portray here to, or to share with you is some of our observation over the, situation, the regional situation of the Middle East to speak a bit about the challenges or the risks that it gives to Israel and to the IDF. I'll speak about the opportunities that we can find in that situ situation as well and to speak about how do we deal with those issues in our daily campaigns and our build-up of uh, our forces. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. The low there is the. Yeah. Oh, at the end. Okay. Okay. So two maps that will tell the story that the uh, former uh, Minister Yellon just, tell, just told you. The Middle East until 2000, the end of 2010, looks on the maps and in many ways on the ground that way states with borders and really uh, big entities that we, could, that we could find. It's not that all of them were at the same, same level of governance, but that was the story of that area. But if we will move six years later, this is the story of today. An upheaval area with a lot of rifts and uh, clashes, if I would call it that way, between different entities. A lot of them are non-state actors, a lot of them are quite violent and Islamic extremist, and uh, uh, an area which uh, include um, a rift or a struggle between four main political axes: the pro-Iranian one, the Sunni one, headed today by Saudi Arabia, and Egypt is included into in it as well, the global jihad one, which include different branches of Al Qaeda and ISIS. Uh, and maybe there is another, another uh, uh, political camp, which I'm not sure that still exists in a heavier way, which is the Muslim Brotherhood one, which still exists, but it's a question about its weight. Nonetheless, it's not that it only there is a struggle between four forces or main political axes, there is the intervention of, in, of a global or international community into the Middle East in wider way in the last two years. The, headed by America uh, coalition against ISIS from one side and the Russian intervention last year vis-a-vis -vis the Russian regime, uh, mostly in Syria, but in some cases in other areas. So where does Israel stay in all that story? In an almost miraculous way, Israel somehow, in that upheaval area, is at the eye of the storm and not in the storm. And one of our main challenges is how to keep from one side keep us at the eye of the storm and on the other side to be uh, aware enough or ready enough to an escalation that will put us in other place. So these are the, the main the look about the area. Now, one can claim that this situation make a lot of opportunities to Israel, to weaken enemies and so, and maybe they have lack resources to buy weapons or to proliferate or pro to product some of it, but the bad news is that the Middle East is still a great or a very, there is a way, very wide room for production, proliferation, uh, and using even of arms in different struggles. So from the Israeli perspective, the threats or the military threats that we can see are divided or are at wide spectrum that inc include from one side non-conventional uh, weapons. Today we can see using of chemical agents, for example, in Syria, we saw that in Iraq, and so on, from one side. And on the other side, we can find the inspirational terror, lone wolves that can come out and do by themselves a terror event, or even non-kinetic um, uh, threats such as cyber or legitimacy problems that uh, or struggles that uh, the, uh, many BDS organizations trying to do. In between, uh, in between, there is a big threat for us, which I try to portray here um, in two uh, slogans here. The first one is what we call VNSAs, or hybrid organizations such as Hamas and Hezbollah, which has a lot of what I wrote here, SSM and SSRs, rockets and missiles that are headed to Israel. And as uh, our former IDI chief uh, spoke about two years ago at Herzliya conference, he told them that there are more than 
200,000 rockets and missiles that are headed to Israel in every moment. And that's the reality. Now we have to face it and to protect ourselves, or at least convince not to use it uh, vis-a-vis -vis those organizations. Now, those organizations are not only a problem when speaking about firepower that can be uh, headed or launched into Israel. We are speaking also uh, about another operational and humanitarian challenge. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, and this is one example to that. From the humanitarian perspective, I want to show you what, just one example. This is the village which is called Shakra in southern Lebanon. This is a civilian village with 4,000 uh, people, Shiite, Lebanese Shiite, that uh, reflect the situation in every neighborhood, town, or village of Shiites in Lebanon. At that village, one third of the houses includes military asset of Hezbollah. Now, that's the situation in every Shiite village or neighborhood in Lebanon where Shiites are living. That's the situation in Gaza Strip when speaking about assets of Hamas or the other organizations. The use, this use of uh, people, civilians, as human shields or even as hostages is something that I think that should be condemned from the humanitarian perspective. And when speaking militarily, of course, this is a big challenge. But uh, as you know, or you can understand from this imagery, and I'll move for a moment in Hebrew, Lo Alman Israel, we are working on that, and we know, we have some knowledge about that. And this is a, cha a challenge that I just wanted to share with you. So, as I told you, from non-conventional to VNSAs or hybrid warfare to terror and lone wolves in it. But not everything is so bad or only threatening. There are, and we can see, few opportunities. First of all, because of the upheaval and not only because of that, we see weakened or some processes of weakening some of our enemies. First of all, we can't speak today about a current major military state threats. The Syrian army is doing something else, and we don't uh, predict or assess that there is uh, uh, a current threat right now. Second, some of other enemies are weakening because of domestic fightings. Third, we think, and it's very slippery slope, but still that the Israeli deterrence is relatively stable. The strategic deterrence and even the operational and the tactical deterrence. And besides that, we can find some places that common interest can serve us vis-a-vis -vis the region and vis-a-vis -vis the international community. For example, counterterrorism, defending borders, and even to some extent how to defend the last one, the civilian dimensions of cooperation that maybe we can promote, such as energy, infrastructure, and, and so on with uh, the region and also with the international community, water, and uh, so on. So how do we deal with that? These, the four uh, part of that slide, reflects what we used to, to uh, say as the four pillars of the national uh, security concept of Israel. There is a debate, by the way, if all of them are absolutely updated. I would claim that for sure the deterrence and the defense are absolutely updated. Uh, the early warning is, I can call it uh, intelligence uh, uh, depths, but never mind or with them, I would claim that there is another issue, and I would claim that the IDF or our whole activity, defense activity, is strive to widen the strategic depth of Israel. That's what we try to do by cooperation, by preventing others from doing bad things to Israel, uh, by preparing for war, by deterring. All of them are part of it, but widening our strategic depth is something that I think is, the, is in the middle of our concept. So what are we doing on the ground to fulfill it? That's how it looks on our daily life. We try to make a prevention concept which includes or lays on deterrence, on containment or limiting capabilities and even will of enemies to attack us or confront violently with us, and maybe from time to time to find incentives to keep the column or to, 
to call an atmosphere or to postpone escalation. On the map, I show you some implication of that. For example, when speaking about Jordan and Egypt, the peace agreement state, we have strategic cooperation. In other places, we try to find some, make some tactical depth, part of it by humanitarian aid, for example, such as Syrian injured people that are coming to Israel. We are speaking today about a bit less than 3,000 uh, uh, Syrians that had been uh, treated at the Israeli hospitals and stuff like that. Uh, uh, deterring and other things at the Lebanese arena and stabilization uh, and, um, and deterrence at the other areas. For example, at the Palestinian arenas, we are doing civilian effort vis-a-vis -vis deterrence, vis-a-vis -vis different kinds of uh, um, readiness that we are doing. All of that is laid or escorted by, of course, the strategic relationship that we have the U.S. and the U.S. defense uh, administration, as what we call safety measures or deconfliction uh, channels that we have to the Russians in an attempt not to get into any kind of uh, uh, worse situation vis-a-vis -vis them. Uh, readiness that we are continuing to keep all the time, I'll speak about it in a minute. And as I told you, regional cooperation, that only part of it is uh, reflected on the map. There are other covered uh, dimensions of it and areas which are not on the map right now. But this is good for daily life. And I can tell you that it's working from, for the vast majority of the time. But there is a possibility that it wouldn't work in, in some point. And for that, we are doing, uh, or we're preparing ourselves to the things that are written here. Because escalations can be very fast at that area and very fast vis-a-vis -vis the IDF and Israel. So we have to prepare ourselves besides that prevention and containment strategies that we are doing on a daily life or the ongoing campaign, the continuous campaign. We have to prepare ourselves to be ready for immediate response because terror attack and even complicated terror attack can be very short. And we have to retaliate to that or be prepared for, uh, to that. Then we have to defense in all borders and dimensions, which mean in the air, in the sea, in the ground, underground, and at the cyber dimension, and to be prepared to make an offensive uh, um, uh, attack, if needed, in two fronts in parallel. These are capabilities. That's what we are uh, keeping. But at the end, what we are trying to do is to postpone prevent weaken enemies, and keep a continuous campaign, and only if needed to get to those escalation and those capabilities of the IDF. Uh, and that's our reality on our daily life. So not only threats, some opportunities. Thank you.